Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thank you for joining us on this Sunday evening. Here's what we've got coming up tonight. If you haven't heard the message yet, lots of advocates want you to cast your ballot this election cycle. And black women are one of the most active voting blocks in the country. We'll talk about how they became a formidable force in elections. So in, in class, Ms. Cochran was my teacher. And the kids was laughing. She was Chicago's laughing. King of Comedy, Bernie Mac, would have turned 63 this week. We'll hear the story behind his storytelling genius from a 2003 interview. For 48 years, the Chicago Reporter has investigated issues of race and poverty, but its abrupt hiatus announcement and dismissal of its editor and publisher has former staffers demanding answers. Oh my God, look at that. Had dinner yet? If not, You'll be hungry after this story. Meet a local food blogger raising money for black owned restaurants. But first, some of the top stories from this past week. Vice presidential hopeful Senator Kamala Harris made history, becoming the first black woman to stand on a vice presidential debate stage. She traded barbs with current Vice President Mike Pence over racial injustice, the president's tax returns and the COVID-19 response. They still don't have a plan. Well, Joe Biden does. And our plan is about what we need to do around a national strategy for contact tracing, for testing, for administration of the vaccine. And quite frankly, uh, when I look at their plan that talks about advancing testing, creating new PPE, developing a vaccine, um, it looks a little bit like plagiarism. Each candidate is also accused of dodging a few questions from the moderator over climate change and being ready to step in as president as both presidential candidates have advanced age. Now, due to the coronavirus outbreak at the White House, Harris and Pence were separated by 12 feet and plexiglass barriers. And of course, we'll have more on the impact of black women on the coming election in just a bit. Chase Bank says it's increasing mortgage lending in black and brown communities in Chicago by $600 million, a 60% increase. The bank says it's part of a nationwide effort committing an additional $30 billion over the next five years to expand affordable housing and home ownership, banking access, and workforce development. The bank acknowledges to WBEZ that its reporting, along with demonstrations and protests from activists, played a role in this commitment. Reports showed the bank sent roughly 80% of its home purchase lending dollars to white communities in Chicago and just 2% to black communities and 5% to Latino communities. Mental health services should be easier to access for some neighbors under a funding plan the city announced earlier this week. 32 community-based organizations are receiving $8 million in annual grant funding to provide trauma-informed mental health care in the neighborhoods with the highest need. The Chicago Department of Public Health says the majority of those organizations will expand services for children, teens, and young adults, and an additional $1.6 million will provide holistic health care services for people experiencing homelessness. And to hear more from two of the community-based organizations providing mental health services, you can visit our website. And for the latest news and information on any story, check out WTTW.com news. Up next, how black women have become a formidable force in elections. Chicago Tonight, Black Voices is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Though the 15th Amendment, ratified in 1870, secured the right to vote for black Americans, it would be nearly a century before all blacks could vote without intimidation. And though the 19th Amendment of 1920 gave women the right to vote, black women were again left disenfranchised. It wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that the right to vote was secured for black men and women. Today, those women are considered the backbone of the Democratic Party, despite what advocates call a resurgence in voter suppression tactics. Joining us to talk about how, despite it all, black women continue to stroll to the polls are 
Felicia Davis, president and CEO of Chicago Foundation for Women, and author and activist Michelle Duster. She is also the great granddaughter of iconic journalist Ida B. Wells. Welcome both of you to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. So uh, Michelle, let's start with you, please. Why didn't the 19th Amendment sort of finish the job uh, for black women to vote? Wow. Um, well, shortly after um, 1920, when um, the 19th Amendment was signed or um, signed into law, um, immediately <laughs> um, certain states um, decided to um, impose their own sort of states' rights um, policies. And those policies or um, rules basically disenfranchised um, predominantly um, black communities. Um, so, you know, with like um, grandfather clauses, poll taxes, um, uh, literacy tests, um, just a, a variety of different um, sort of tricks, basically, that didn't make it seem like it was about being black, but it was about, but, but inherently, uh, it would, in, it would impact uh, mostly black people. And Felicia Davis, you know, if Joe Biden is elected, he will be the oldest president to ever take office. So that obviously makes his vice presidential pick uh, all the more important. Uh, what impact do you think it will have or will it mean for Senator Kamala Harris to be on the ticket, particularly for black women and getting them to vote? I, I think it's tremendous. Um, there's a lot of excitement. Um, there is a feeling of it's long overdue. Um, black women have historically gone to the polls in the highest numbers. Um, and they bring with them their family members and their communities. Um, if you look at the voter turnout in the last two elections, if that was repl were replicated in 2020, that would mean 100 million more black women um, would be going to the polls. And so in some respects, it feels like to elect or to have on the ticket a black woman um, with her intersectional self as the, in the second highest office in the country is really um, monumental and you can feel it. You can feel um, the excitement. You can see the mobilization that's taking place as um, women across the country are um, are supporting um, her and, and calling friends and family and, go, and getting them to make a plan to vote and then certainly um, getting them to the polls. Now, as we mentioned, Senator Harris uh, made history when she took to the vice presidential debate stage uh, earlier this week. Here's a little bit of what she said. And I'm a, I'm a former career prosecutor. I know what I'm talking about. Bad cops are bad for good cops. We need reform of our policing in America and our criminal justice system, which is why Joe and I will immediately ban chokeholds and carotid holes. George Floyd would be alive today if we did that. Felicia Davis, what are some of the issues that black women want to see tackled in this election cycle? I think, um, you know, economic um, security and opportunity for women is paramount. Um, when you look at historically, women are already underpaid compared, black women are underpaid um, compared to white men and, and basically white women and almost everyone else. Um, so economic security and opportunity for women, um, the violence, um, the reauthorization for the Violence Against Women Act, which has not happened in this Congress. And so tackling those issues of public safety and safety for women and girls, as well as um, some relief when it comes to student loan debt. So in our country, um, women are overwhelmingly carrying the, the burden and black women specifically of student loan debt. Um, my cynic says sometimes it's probably why we haven't seen a relief package come out for student loan um, debt relief um, just yet. Um, and a whole and healthcare. Oh, I, how could I forget healthcare? <laughs> Access to healthcare with this pandemic um, front and center. Um, the two um, pandemics that America is fighting right now, we still have the impact of the health. Um, impacts of the pandemic, but also the racial overlay that, um, as we see it bearing out in communities across the country, um, black women and black communities are bearing the brunt of this um, from an economic standpoint, um, as well as a um, health uh, standpoint. And so a lot of issues there. Um, Michelle Duster, you know, black women have long been uh, dedicated members and activists in the Democratic Party, uh, especially showing up in recent election cycles. Hillary Clinton, of course, in the last uh, presidential election, Doug Jones in Alabama, Mike Espy in Mississippi. Why is that? 
I think that, um, like Felicia um, just mentioned, um, so many of the issues that are important to uh, Black women and um, the Black community overall, um, it just so correlates with a lot of people who are in the Democratic Party or the um, Democratic candidates. Um, the platform that you know, a lot of these um, candidates stand for is holistic, it's inclusive, um, it's intersectional, and um, I think addresses a lot of the issues that impact our everyday lives. Now, that said, Michelle Duster, you know, the Democratic Party has also been accused of taking black women for granted. What are your thoughts there? I mean, there there can be that argument um, because, but I think part of the reason why um, that uh, black women overall are sort of attracted to the Democratic Party is because of the platform and the issues and the values that the um, that the party stands for. So, I mean, if you're if the party stands for what we believe in and what we think is important and what what matters to us, then you know, and then you think of the alternative, then it's like they're really kind of only two choices um, in our country right now. Uh, Felicia Davis, what would you say are some of the biggest threats to voting uh, happening right now? Oh, uh, one, I think the misinformation around how one can safely vote um, with um, in the, in the uh, era of COVID and also this um, misinformation campaign that's been going on around mail, vote by mail. Um, so I think that those tactics to suppress vote um, are really the number one threat right now. And I think we need to make it clear to everyone, um, this year is unusual, but there um, are lots of ways, you know, the election is happening right now. And so no one has to wait until November 3rd. So if people have mail-in ballots at their home, um, not let it sit under the table with a bunch of bills, but to get that in the mail right, right away. Yeah, a Obviously, lot of advocates have been, yeah, we've been hearing it left and right. A lot of advocates telling you, make a plan to vote, 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 vote is what I, I think a lot of them have been saying. I think we've been hearing it loud and clear. Uh, we're actually out of time, sadly. My thanks to Felicia Davis and Michelle Duster for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brandon. And up next, in a conversation recorded earlier, former staffers demand answers after a 48-year-old investigative publication is put on hiatus. But first, Chicago's Bernie Mac would have celebrated his 63rd birthday on October 5th. In this week's throwback from a 2003 interview, the king of comedy reflects on growing up as a funny kid in Englewood. So in, in class, Miss Cochran was my teacher, and the kids was laughing, and she was at the, at the blackboard, and she turned around. She said, Bernie, why don't you share it with it? I said, I didn't do nothing. She said, I know you did it. She said, come and share it with the whole class. <laughs> and I came up. She said, matter of fact, tell the story. Tell the, tell the kids a story. Amuse us. And I said, okay. And I just told the story for about a half an hour. And she looked at me. And every Friday we had recreational day. She started allowing me to come up to tell stories. And then she started using that against the class. All right, if you don't behave, Bernie's not going to tell the story. So then one day she went to the principal and she told the principal that she had me and she wanted him to see me do this story. Well, that Friday, about three classes was in, my, in our classroom and the principal. And I went up and I told a story. And ever since then, I got a reputation. For 48 years, the Chicago Reporter has operated as an investigative nonprofit news source, shining light on the city's racial disparities and problems impacting Chicagoans living in poverty. But as of mid-September, the reporter has stopped publication, having been put on hiatus by its faith-based nonprofit owner, the Community Renewal Society. Its editor and publisher position has been eliminated, and dozens of former staffers are demanding answers. Joining us are two former Chicago Reporter st members, staff members, Laura Washington, former editor and publisher of the Chicago Reporter, Washington's currently a Chicago Sun-Times columnist and ABC7 political analyst, and Angela Caputo, a former investigative reporter for the Chicago Reporter. Caputo is currently an investigative reporter for American Public Media Reports. Now, before we start, we should let you know that we received a statement today from the Community Renewal Society's Executive Director, Reverend Waltrina Middleton. And before we uh, get to questions with our guests, I want to read a bit of that statement. 
It reads in part, conversations around restructuring at the Chicago Reporter have been underway for months and that knowledge has been internally communicated. That is why we are reimagining our future and working toward a structure that includes an advisory table made up of key stakeholders who will help with newsroom staffing searches and hiring decisions. The future of the Chicago Reporter is not in jeopardy, despite the manufactured hysteria and speculation that began in the hands of non-credible sources. And for our viewers, uh, you can read the entirety of that statement on our website. Uh, Laura Washington, though, let's start with you, please. What do you know about the Chicago Reporter's current hiatus? Well, I probably know a lot more just from hearing that statement, Brandis, than I knew earlier today. Uh, for over a week, we have been sending letters, uh, leaving messages. And when I say we, I mean reporter alums, but also other people who are concerned in the community with the community radio society to get some answers because all we knew was that the news organization had been shut down and had been silenced. We're very concerned even now with this statement because it suggests that there's going to be, a, as she says, a reimagining of the of the news organization that will take away editorial control or at least compromise it. Some kind of an advisory board, uh, uh, community renewal society staff would be in control of decision making, would be in control of hiring, would be in control of editorial content. And that, by definition, means there would no longer be a credible independent publication. Have you heard from the community renewal society? since you've been sending all these letters and making these comments? Uh, we actually, just this afternoon, uh, I received a, an email from Dr. Middleton, the, the, the CRS executive director, act, asking me if I'd be willing to meet. And I'm hoping to, um, and I responded, and, and, we're, and we're, we're hoping to meet with a number of representatives from the reporter alumni to, to get some answers because these this statement and what we know so far raises more questions than answers. Angela Caputo, tell us a little bit more about the reporter's journalistic mission. Well, the reporter, you know, has been around before any of these nonprofit uh, outlets in Chicago, which are really increasingly important. And I think the reporter is as important as ever. But, you know, the reporter for being such a small outlet has really made huge changes for people in Chicago. Um, elderly people in a nursing home in a black neighborhood are getting similar staffing hours now to elderly people in a nursing home in a white neighborhood. We no longer have uh, kids, 17 year olds, sitting out, sitting it out in the Cook County Jail on a felony charge for a nonviolent offense or, you know, winding through the felony courts. Kids are no longer just automatically bumped up on nonviolent offenses. Um, and, you know, there's a landmark Justice Department settlement around the foreclosure crisis and all of the predatory lending that just decimated our neighborhoods. That's just a few of the accomplishments that um, that we, you know, that are because of the Chicago Reporter over all these years. And in that letter that you all sent to the Community Renewal Society, Angela, you also recognize, you know, the number of alumni who have come through uh, the Reporter and the kind of training uh, and experience they got there. Yeah, and you know, like there's a big conversation right now about diversity and inclusion in uh, newsrooms and in all sorts of industries. And the Chicago Reporter has been for nearly 50 years creating leaders, people of color and white people, journalists, who've gone on to um, win Pulitzer Prizes, who are now leading some of the biggest news organizations in the country and even our, um, our local newsrooms here in Chicago. So there's just been this like substantial training and investment in people that has really contributed to better journalism and a better life for all of us in Chicago. And so Laura Washington, you know, as we mentioned in the statement, uh, it's, it doesn't seem that the reporter is going to be shut down, um, but instead sort of restaffed and repurposed. And uh, the statement, which again can be read in, in entirety on our website, um, isn't 100% isn't clear on how that editorial direction will be taken. But Laura Washington, have you spoken to any, uh, any previous or more recent employees? Have they echoed um, anything that Reverend Middleton says in this statement? Uh, the only thing we're hearing from is, 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 as a matter of fact, we have a letter signed by well over 100 reporter alumni who are deeply concerned about just the mere fact that you would shut down this news organization, put it on hiatus with no notice, with no transparency, remove the editor and publisher. Right now, the reporter is without editorial direction, without editorial control. If, if it, it really undermines its credibility as we speak. How can a news organization, how can a publication 
publish and have an impact and have a voice if it if it really essentially doesn't exist. There's just so many questions that have been raised by this and the lack of transparency and the fact that uh, the Community Renewal Society has been so silent and so unresponsive to our concerns is very troubling. We need some transparency. We need to find out exactly what the plan is. And we want assurances that the that the the wall between the editorial and and the business side the business side being community renewal, renewal society is not breached and that the news organization will continue to be controlled and run by credible independent journalists okay we'll have to leave it there my thanks to laura washington and angela caputo thanks so much thanks for having us up next how a locally founded website is promoting black owned restaurants but first to paris shuts and what's on tap chicago tonight this week Brandis, we've got a lot coming up this week to talk about. We kick off our candidate forums with the hotly contested 3rd Congressional District and debating the graduated income tax amendment on the ballot in November. That's all this week at 7 here on 11. Whether it's a steep decline in business due to COVID-19 or property damage following civil unrest, restaurants have not had it easy for most of 2020. Here in Chicago, there's a man doing his best to elevate black owned restaurants through social media. Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia recently met up with Jeremy Joyce, the founder of Black People Eats, to learn more. Here's another look. These waffles are so good. Jeremy Joyce is enjoying some waffles at Cleo Southern Cuisine in the Bronzeville neighborhood on Chicago's south side. Everything we do is Creole spiced, but it's, it has a southern flair. Uh-oh, look, look at this, y'all. Look oh, at this. Yeah. Jeremy's not just a regular customer. He's the man behind Black People Eats, a website showcasing black-owned restaurants. Furthering the cause in the black community, that's what we pride ourselves with. Yes, Connecting people to black-owned restaurants and helping black-owned restaurants increase their revenue through media. Cleo's wasn't even one year old when COVID-19 hit Chicago. The restaurant had to let go of two part-time employees and is now only open on the weekend. Still, owner Chrissy Harper says they're adapting. Our kitchen is small, our restaurant is small, so customers love coming in and being able to interact with us, and we can't really do that you know, through the door. So we really try to bump up our customer service, and TT literally is on the phone taking orders for like 17 minutes, just having conversations. Mm -hmm. you know, so we won't lose that connection with our customers. Oh my God. Look at Today, Jeremy is trying the pan seared salmon with lump crab meat and sweet chili sauce. He was kind enough to share some with me. I get something special with that sauce. Mm. Oh my. That yeah, sauce with the rice? Yeah. Now you understand, right? It makes sense now. Okay. People do not understand until they actually try mm. it because it's like, okay, yeah, everybody makes salmon. Okay, you no, can it's make it. <laughs> well, it's also what you put it in. Yeah. Great sauce. Mm -hmm. Really good. You like it? No. Yeah, I like it. You know what's crazy? It what tastes think, better when you heat it. I text her the next day. I said, yo, it's even better the next day. Because <laughs> the sauce is somehow just sunk in. Cleo's is one of several restaurants benefiting from the Black-Owned Restaurant Relief Fund, a GoFundMe Jeremy started to help restaurants featured on his site. So we was able to raise $75,000. We were able to split the money evenly among 54 restaurants. And actually, the checks are in the mail, and they're going out to Black-Owned restaurants to help further their business. The president of the Illinois Restaurant Association has said Chicago restaurants have seen an average 80% loss in revenue during the COVID-19 pandemic. Another Black-owned business getting help from Jeremy is the ice cream shop Kilwins in Hyde Park. I'll tell you how the smell is going to hit. Jackie Jackson owns this Kilwins and two others in the loop. He is getting the community involved with supporting Black-owned small businesses and he's been very successful and it has been definitely a big surge in business since this has started, since this initiative has started. Jeremy's from Chicago's south suburbs. Since he started Black People Eats in December 2017, the site has expanded to include Atlanta, Houston, D.C., and other U.S. cities. The goal is to just create a Black People Eats in every city, a company that can truly connect the world to black restaurants everywhere. Salmon. For Chicago Tonight, this is Evan Garcia. Oh, man. I now who's hungry? 
Black People Eats is hosting a virtual food festival called Blacktober, which features discounts, virtual cooking classes, and more. You can find more on that on our website. And before we go, we want to take one minute to remind you that the news you rely on here at WTTW is made possible with viewer support. Here's how you can help. Chicago is a city of neighborhoods, the places we call home. WTTW News and Chicago Tonight report the stories that drive our communities. We shed light on the issues that impact your life. Our news team is dedicated to bringing you fair and fact-based local news that empowers you. It's the reliable information you need to make decisions when it matters most. Our independent journalism is always free and available to every Chicagoan, both on air and online. This essential community news service is only possible with your support. Please consider becoming a member of WTTW. It's quick and easy to join, and you can contribute at any level that's comfortable for you. All donations are welcome, and every dollar makes a difference. After joining, you can choose your thank you gift. Your generous support will help keep trusted, independent journalism on public television. Thank you for your support. And that's our show for this Sunday night. Join Paris Schutz and me tomorrow at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of their attorneys selected for the 2020 Illinois Super Lawyers List.